Jenny Shalee, thanks so much for joining us on G-Zero World. Great to be here, Aid. Tell us a little bit about what your organization is responsible for, your remit, uh, both in the U.S. and globally. It's actually the newest agency in the federal government. We were set up in 2018 to really be America's cyber defense agency. And our mission is to lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk to the cyber and physical infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour of every day. When you say things like critical infrastructure, though, Ian, people think it's a really technical term. But at the end of the day, it's the water, it's the power, it's how we get gas at the pump, how we get food at the grocery store. So it's really those networks and systems and data that underpin everything we need to run our lives. And so we are responsible for working with our partners to protect and defend that infrastructure. Now, I want that agency to exist, and I'm glad that you're running it. But of course, when you talk about critical infrastructure in the United States, at least, uh, most of that is owned by, run by, managed by the private sector, not by the US government. And God willing, that's not gonna change anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you do your job effectively, given that you have no control uh, over the actors that are actually doing the defending? Yeah, it's the best thing about being the leader of this agency because it's all about partnerships at the end of the day. As you said it, and that's the way it should be, over 80-some percent, the majority of critical infrastructure is in private hands. And so the challenges in this role are very different from other roles where, where I've been in the Army, uh, overseas in combat, in the intelligence community at NSA, in the White House doing policy, where arguably the federal government has monopoly power. In cybersecurity, the federal government is just a partner a partner with state and local colleagues and a partner with industry. And so we have to work together collaboratively, realizing that government can't solve this problem, industry can't, state and local colleagues can't. So we all have to work together to drive down risk to the nation. You know, it's very instructive. Before I took this job, I was working at Morgan Stanley uh, doing cybersecurity defense and leading resilience. And uh, when I was still there working on the transition, solar winds happened. Experts believe Russia was behind the hack of a company called Solar Winds, sending malware to 18,000 private and government organizations. And a lot of people took different lessons from Solar Winds. But the big lesson, one of the big lessons that I took was that it wasn't the federal government. It wasn't the incredible intelligence community or some other capability that we've been building that discovered that massive espionage campaign that affected- It was a cyber company. It was a cyber company. It was my good friend, Kevin Mandy at FireEye. Yeah. And so yeah. that what that really told me is we have to work hand in hand with these companies to be able to see the dots, connect the dots and drive down risk to the nation at scale. And that's what's behind things we've been building like the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, some of the partnerships with all of the technology companies. It's just a recognition that this is not something the federal government can do alone. What is it that every member of Congress needs to know better so that you can do your job better? I have been incredibly impressed since I took this job and encouraged, frankly, because we live in a world, uh, in a country at least, where um, partisanship affects a lot of things, but frankly, it has not affected cybersecurity. We have incredible support from both sides of the aisle and some real champions on both sides of the aisle of folks who've gotten incredibly smart on cybersecurity. There's some terrific support of people who've actually uh, done the work to learn about these issues so that they can help make CISA as successful as where we need to be in it. And frankly, you see it reflected in increase in budgets every year, increase in authorities, increase in responsibilities. And that has been, again, incredibly encouraging. And since I took this job over the past year, today's my, by the way, one year anniversary. Um, since I took this job, we have had support on both sides of the aisle. Let me ask you, you said that 80% of critical infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector. Uh, I want you to give me your back of the envelope percentage in terms of the significance of the threat environment from other countries, as opposed to from criminal actors that are not affiliated with governments. So 
the reason why I can't give you a great back of the number, you know, maybe I'll say it's 50-50, Ian, but the reason why we don't have great data is because there has never been a mandate to report things like cyber incidents to the U.S. government. And so certainly we see nation state attacks, uh, big breaches that make their way into the news, uh, certainly solar winds, the uh, attack we saw in Colonial Pipeline, JBS Foods, Kaseya Software, Equifax a couple years ago. So those things that hit the news, you can, um, the attribution ultimately comes out. Some are nation states. The big four are, of course, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. Uh, and then you have a whole ecosystem of cyber criminals to include those who are deploying ransomware. And some of those groups are aligned with nation states. Some of them are given safe haven. Some of them have a sponsorship, uh, but very hard given that we don't have a baseline of data. It's why, again, going back to the Congress, um, they uh, actually passed earlier this year a groundbreaking a set of legislation, the Cyber Incident Reporting for Critical Infrastructure Act, which for the first time, they've been trying to get this thing passed for over a decade. For the first time, there will be a requirement for critical infrastructure to report to CISA if they have a cyber incident. So we can not only use that data to render assistance, to warn others, but also to get a much better understanding of what's going on so that we can be able to react and respond uh, and to drive down risk in a much more systematic way. So a lot that we don't know, and we don't know because right now the incentives and the requirements to report are not close to what they should be. Um, on the China side, uh, I mean, one thing that I've always found interesting is how behind the curve the Americans have been, the American government has been in assessing Chinese technological capabilities. 10 years ago, nobody in Washington remotely believed that the Chinese could be at parity with the US in technology and basic technologies by 2022. And here I'm talking about productive technologies. I'm talking about parts of AI. I'm talking about voice recognition, facial recognition. How confident are you that we understand China's offensive cyber capabilities that they could deploy against the United States? I mean, I think we have a very good understanding of the major threats out there from adversaries. So we have um, huge capabilities, uh, as you know, in the intelligence community. We've been building capabilities to understand uh, from a military perspective, you know, our North Star, we are the defenders. So my whole life is about cyber defense. Uh, but in order to be a good defender, uh, we have to understand the offense as well. And that's why my time in the intelligence community really has helped uh, me be a better defender. But, you know, at the end of the day, you bring up something that I really worry about. I worry about the next 10 years being a decisive time when we will be able to win the battle or lose the battle for technological innovation. When you look at things like who is setting, setting the standards for technology these days, um, most of the chairs and vice chairs of those committees are Chinese. Um, so the government has a very heavy hand in what are going to be those technology standards of the future. Um, I worry about things like how are we going to get ahead of 6G when we kind of failed to do it with 5G. What about artificial intelligence? What about biotech? What about quantum? One thing that I'm starting to put a big focus on at CISA, working with our international partners, is smart cities. When you think about everything getting digitized, that's so great. You know, everything's so much easier when everything's smart, but think about the risks of that. And so there's so much that we need to do to truly invest in research, in people, in technology, in capabilities, to be able to stay ahead of this uh, this power curve when it comes to technology innovation. Is it a plausible scenario that in the next 10 years, the Chinese could become technologically dominant compared to the United States? I think it's a concern. I think it is a concern. And so that's why I think we need to ensure we have the alliances. Uh, we are building the right incentive models. We are investing in the research to keep the edge on technological innovation. Uh, I think it's, you know, it, it is not at all clear uh, that we are always going to be dominant in that. And that's why the investment is so important. 
Now, I mean, given how much we're hammering the Russians and given how badly they've been performing militarily in the field in Ukraine, does that mean, does that also translate into Russia's cyber future, that China's really where we should be more worried about, even though the Russians historically have been the bigger concern? Yeah, the short answer is no. I mean, you've heard the old trope that Russia's a hurricane, China is climate change. And certainly if you look at the long term, when we think about uh, the size of China, the investments that they're making in their capabilities, yeah, a serious long-term concern, particularly about some of the emerging tech issues that I just addressed. But they are both, along with uh, Iran and North Korea, very formidable uh, adversaries from a cyber perspective. They have placed a lot of investment in all of their capabilities and in their people, and we should not uh, take the wrong lessons from the fact that uh, Russia has not done as well as many of us expected militarily in Ukraine. And so we have been for several months now running a campaign called Shields Up uh, to help everybody understand that we are in an elevated threat environment. We know that the Russian playbook is all about using cyber uh, to go after critical infrastructure. We've seen that many times in Ukraine. We've seen it here in the U.S., uh, and we need to be prepared to be able to respond to any sort of attacks, whether it's a direct attack on our critical infrastructure or whether yeah. it's a, a ransomware group that might be aligned that could give Russia some plausible deniability, but could have a serious impact, as we saw in Colonial Pipeline uh, last May. Now, that was before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That was before the unprecedented U.S. and other uh, allied sanctions against Russia. I have to presume that we expect that there's going to be a full-throated cyber response, retaliation from the Russians. But am I to understand that since the invasion of Ukraine, you have not seen significant cyber attacks, successful or unsuccessful, against critical infrastructure in the United States from Russia? We have seen no cyber attacks, as we would say, uh, on critical infrastructure um, of any of any note that we know of. Again, there are uh, cases where there may be uh, an impact, but certainly given our role in protecting and defending critical infrastructure, that would very likely have been something that came to us. So. Uh, so no, we we have right. not, but we continue to tell all of our partners that uh, we are not out of the woods. We need to continue to uh, stay vigilant and keep our shields up and keep focused on maintaining uh, security and resilience capabilities for the, you know, for the nation. Are you a little surprised by that? I, I think I would have expected to see something at this point in time, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of thinking around this. In, in my mind, there's probably two things. So deterrence by punishment, I think there's a little bit of a fear of escalation uh, if there was some type of an, an attack here. So certainly the warnings that have been given, I think um, most of the significant attacks have really been uh, within Ukraine. So I think there's a little bit of deterrence by punishment. But I'd also like to think, Ian, that there's been some deterrence by denial. I think we have really... Um, raise the red flag on this, given a sense of urgency. We have briefed our critical infrastructure partners at all levels, um, thousands of people around the country, hundreds of briefings. We have briefed at classified levels. We've worked with the intelligence community to who have been incredibly supportive to aggressively declassify information that can be used in an actionable way to defend networks. So I think part of this is really digging in on defense. I think there's a concern uh, about escalation for uh, retaliation. And I also think there's, you know, just a huge focus within Ukraine, given that uh, it hasn't gone as well as what was originally expected. We haven't talked much about terrorist organizations. Given the level of terrorist attacks that have been out there, why you think we haven't seen more effective cyber capabilities from major terrorist organizations? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, my last job before I went to Morgan Stanley was a, that was as senior director for counterterrorism at the NSC. Um, and this was during 2013 to 2016. So this was uh, the rise of ISIS, all of the attacks around the world. Uh, and it was a question we often wondered. There were low level attacks, things like uh, doxing, so taking names and putting them out publicly and um, threatening to um, go knock on their door and create, you know, physical physical harm. 
but we have actually not seen uh, uh, any sort of development by terrorists of significant cyber capabilities. Um, and so when I think about the schema for what I worry about on the landscape, uh, I worry about nation states because they are the most sophisticated, they are the most well-resourced. I worry about cyber criminals because they have actually been able to raise their game significantly over the past couple of years, and they've made it easier because a lot of these as-a-service tools, like ransomware as a service, are much more widely available. So sadly, that ecosystem has been democratized. Um, you have hacktivists, and we've seen a bit of that with the deface, defacements and the distributed denial of service. And then you have cyber terrorism. And, and frankly, I think that is a, um, I always think of it as a low probability, but it is not a threat uh, that is high on my uh, landscape right now. So then final question around that is, um, you know, when I was growing up and you too, we were very worried about uh, the proliferation of nuclear technology, weapons um, and capabilities. And, you know, the Americans and the Soviets had arms control, but we also all wanted to ensure that the nuclear club stayed as small as possible. We devoted a lot of effort internationally to that. Uh, I don't hear or see us devoting a lot of effort to the prevention of proliferation of dangerous cyber capabilities. And I'm wondering why you think that is and what can and should be done. To state the obvious, it's incredibly difficult to um, be able to verify uh, whether somebody is developing or the amount of cyber weapons that they have in the way that we could um, actually verify nuclear capabilities and come together and have an agreement on a, on a treaty. In some ways, it's even complicated, although I do think we're getting better at this to attribute a cyber attack. But again, in terms of developing these capabilities, you're exactly right. There are many, there's dozens of nations now that um, have developed uh, what we call offensive. That's sort of point one. Point two is um, these types of capabilities uh, may start out for um, things like collecting intelligence, which is lawful in many cases, uh, but then they can be used um, for destructive or disruptive purposes, which you certainly wouldn't want, particularly if it was against critical infrastructure or against cyber responders or against emergency responders. And so um, we do not have uh, those, uh, uh, we do not have those rules in place. This is where I think, and I'm a bit of an, a norm skeptic, I have to say, um, but I do think at least articulating what we think should be absolutely out of bounds um, as a normative point, I do think is important. Things like civilian critical infrastructure, um, things like, again, first respond capabilities, things like emergency, uh, computer emergency response teams. Um, so I think that's probably the right direction to go in and the best we can do. Jen Easterly, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Ian. Great to be with you.